Hello everyone, we're getting ready to look up today with a brand new Uplook video with an enlightening top 10 list. You can like the video, subscribe, and ring the bell to make sure you don't miss out on any of our future videos. Today's topic, 10 characteristics of a helpful sermon. There is a wide array of venues for communicating God's truth. The Lord Jesus used many of them. Question and answer, story time, object lessons, public debates, and so on. But the best way for the rapid deployment of the truth is preaching. What makes for good preaching? How can we improve our own skills or encourage those we know who preach? Here is a list of some characteristics. Number one, is it based on the word and a proper interpretation of the passage? Second Timothy chapter 4 verse 2, preach the word. First Peter 4.11, if anyone speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God. Not simply speak from the oracles of God, but speak as if God was the speaker. So we're not there to try out our pet theories or try out our latest jokes. We are there to communicate the truth of God and it's good for us to realize that God has the best outlines. God has the best ideas. Instead of us trying to impose our ideas on the passage, let the passage speak for itself. I remember years ago there was a young man getting up to speak and uh, he got going on a lot of other things before he actually even read the passage he was going to talk about. And there was an old man in the back row. No one else could see him except the preacher, and I happened to be in the same row. But he simply stood up and held up his Bible and went like this to the young preacher. <laughs> Preach the word. And that's what we need to do. You know, most young preachers make their biggest mistakes before they open the passage. They get up and they start giving an icebreaker or something and they make silly statements in the initiation that undermine what they're going to say when they're preaching the word. Best thing to do, let's turn to this passage and then be quiet for a minute or two while everyone's getting ready. You can learn that silence is not an enemy. You can relax and ask the Lord to help you as you teach the word. But it's really crucial that when we preach, we're actually preaching from the Bible and not imposing our ideas onto the passage to say what we want to say, but saying what God wants to say. Question number two. Does it honestly reflect a message given by God to the preacher? The old timers used to talk about trafficking in unfelt truth. And the idea was that they were up there trying to tell people other things that they themselves had never learned. And it comes across as empty and hypocritical. F.B. Meyer said that the preacher's heart is his first congregation and we should preach the passage to ourselves first. Uh, if I went to a, uh, a restaurant for lunch and uh, there was a sign on the door that said out for lunch and I discovered that the people who work there went to eat somewhere else, I probably wouldn't be too eager to eat there myself. I think it's important for us when we get up to minister the Word of God that before God speaks through us, He speaks to us and we take the passage seriously before we dare tell anyone else how they ought to live. Number three, does it take into account the maturity and spiritual state of the audience? Now, we don't always know everyone who's in the audience, and we're thankful the Holy Spirit of God can take the truth and apply it to different people knowing exactly what their need is. And we're thankful for that. But on the other hand, we should try to take them into account. Sometimes people will speak over the heads of others, and they may think it's a very good message, but if it doesn't connect with the people in the audience, we haven't done the job. Our job is not simply to speak the truth, it's to communicate the truth to the hearts of the people who are there. So I should think about these people and what is their age level, what is their maturity level. Don't start where you are, the preacher, start where they are, 
and bring them to where you are. We see this with the woman at the well, as opposed to Nicodemus. In John 3, Jesus alludes to an Old Testament story in the serpent on the pole. Of course, you'd know these things, Nicodemus, being a ruler of the Jews. On the other hand, he doesn't allude to a passage in the Old Testament to the woman at the well. He didn't think she'd know it. He uses an Old Testament illustration of water to satisfy. He could have quoted, Ho everyone that thirsts, or tell the story of the smitten rock, but he doesn't presume on her Bible knowledge. So we need to start where people are and then bring them across the bridge of truth to where they need to be. Don't start where you are or you'll be like a guy on a train traveling 50 miles an hour and everyone standing at the station saying, well, have a good trip. I have no idea where you came from or where you're going. You've got to get people on the train with you. If you're going to take them on a train of thought, make sure everybody gets on at the first station. Number four, does it speak to present need but proclaim eternal realities? This is an important balance, isn't it? There are some people and they talk about eternal truths but never bring them down to where people live. And so people leave with this disconnection thinking that spiritual things have nothing to do with my Monday morning or my Wednesday afternoon. So there has to be a connection. The Lord Jesus was always doing this, talking about how you relate to your brother or forgiving people or things that happen in everyday life. So it's important that we do that. At the same time, we shouldn't get constantly talking about people in their present problems without getting their eyes up and looking heavenward. So that's an important thing. Now we notice this in Luke 13 where the Lord Jesus talks about something that was in the morning news about the collapse of, of the Tower of Siloam. But he doesn't just talk about the sad tragedy. If he wanted to make a political comment about Pilate and what he did, instead of that, he springboards off that current event to spiritual issues and says, you think that you're more righteous than they were? No, I tell you, you all need to repent. So what he does then is he goes immediately to common issues that everybody relates to so that they can apply them to their own lives. So yes, by all means, talk about present need, but make sure that you also bring in eternal realities. Number five, does it move the mind to think, the heart to feel, and the will to act? We can end up having our sermons like reading a recipe or a menu and not actually eating a meal. So the information's there, but it leaves me completely unmoved. And so the point of preaching is to preach convincingly, to give evidence, to give information that actually causes people to want to change, to want to be like what they're reading in the scriptures. And so, 2 Corinthians 4, 2, we have renounced the hidden things of shame, not walking in craftiness nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. So, the first and great command is to love God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength, not simply to be informed about the theories concerning God, or to argue the case for the existence of God, but to actually engage with God. So this is important as we share the truth. People's minds should be thinking about spiritual things, but their heart should also be feeling certain things and their conscience should be affected so that their will acts in obedience to the truth of God. So what the Bible calls the obedience of faith. I see the truth and I respond to it in an obedient way. Number six, does it have an introduction stating a clear purpose? You've heard the old line, aim at nothing, you'll probably hit it. And a lot of times people are being taken along in a ride and they have no idea where they're going. And they're not sure the preacher knows where he's going. 
So you can begin by asking a question that you're going to answer. Or you can begin by giving an illustration that you're going to apply. Or you can introduce a topic that you're going to cover. But like the title of a book, it draws us into the text. And we should have something that catches people with a hook right at the beginning, whether it's an interesting question that stirs their curiosity or an illustration that gives them a concrete understanding of what's going to be an abstract doctrine or I'm able to introduce them to a topic that they're unfamiliar with and then follow along fleshing out that topic as we go along. Whatever the case is, we need a good introduction with a clear purpose. This is what we hope to get out of this hour's sermon or whatever time we have. I remember I used to almost want it to be uh, a mystery, like, you know, like uh, venturing into this, almost like I wanted a twist or something when I would present, and I found it was more uh, misleading and confusing than enticing, which right. is what I intended for it to right. be. Right. But it was much more clear to have that mm -hmm. statement at the beginning as a roadmap. Number seven, is there order, progress, and clarity in the body of the message? So the famous verse, Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 8, so they read distinctly from the book in the law of God, they gave the sense and helped them to understand the reading. People want to feel that there is a sense of order and a sense of progress as I'm reading through a passage. Uh, if you're traveling out in the prairies and you see a city way off on the horizon and you don't pass anything in between, it seems interminable, like we're never going to get there. Whereas if we're traveling and there are, there are things of interest along the way, oh, look over here, did you see this, did you see that? Then it not only speeds along the way, but gives us a sense of context as to what we're discovering in the journey. So I think when we're studying the Word of God, we want order, we want people to feel like we're making progress, and that's what points do. We've seen this point, now we go on to this point, and there's an order to them. If we keep mixing them up, it's like a person who drives two miles this way, and then a mile back, and then a mile over here, say, well, look, I thought we were going there. Yeah, well, we'll get there eventually, right? It's actually disheartening. So to spend a little time thinking about the order in which we're giving the points so that one builds on the other and we have the sense of progress as we move towards the conclusion. Number eight, does the message have suitable content? I like to think about the difference between a gardener and a chef. Now, a gardener works with pitchforks and shovels and manure and seeds and dirt. A chef has to take that material, potatoes covered in dirt and whatever, and washes them off and peels them and slices them up, slices and dices and cooks them and uses some garnish and presents them in an appetizing way. There are some people, they spend no time in the garden. It's all nouvelle cuisine, right? It's all flourish. It's fancy stuff. It's like the, the fellow who went to the Nouvelle Cuisine restaurant and they asked him, how did you find the steak? And he said, well, I just moved the pea and there it was, right? There are some restaurants and they give you more instruments to eat than they actually give you food. So there are some people and they're very high on flourish, but very low on content. A lot of poetry, a lot of sort of uh, weaving a spell but when you get right down to it, there's virtually no truth there. You'd starve to death. There's not enough to keep a sparrow alive. What Spurgeon used to call oceans of words and spoons full of thought. So we want to have real content. On the other hand, a gardener does a lot of work that doesn't end up on the dining room table. So you don't have to tell the listeners how many ands there are in the chapter. You don't necessarily have to explain every Greek word. Now, you ought to look up the word and know it. 
You have to understand the roots of something, but you don't necessarily have to serve the roots on the table, right? Understanding the difference, spending time seriously cultivating thoughts in the word, but then knowing what needs to be trimmed and what needs to be prepared to feed God's people, we don't always just give them everything out of the garden. There needs to be time in preparation and presentation so that it's appetizing. You can survive on raw potatoes. I've heard about people escaping from a prison camp and just digging potatoes out of the ground and eating them. But it's probably a lot better to prepare them in such a way that they're appetizing. So having both true, not spending all your time in flourish, not spending all your time in the garden, but knowing how to cultivate things and then how to prepare and present them. So they're both healthy and appetizing. And, and Bible teaching can be both. Number nine, is there a pointed, personal, and practical conclusion given? Again, we can ask a searching question, we can sum up the key points, we can give a forceful quote. Preachers sometimes have a hard time landing the plane. They come in a little too fast, and so they do another circuit. Everybody knows they're finished, including themselves, but they can't quite touch down. So what happens, of course, is that sometimes people get their introduction, they know how they're going to start, and they have their outline, but they never put down their last sentence. How am I going to finish this? And so they keep looking for it while everyone's sitting in the audience saying, let me help you with that. So uh, it's a good thing to think, look, just have a final sentence, a final quote, whatever they're going to do. And when you say that, then get done with it and land. So I think it's important that the last sentence does have moment. It has force. It has power. But it's, it's contained. We know what we're going to say. We say it and we're done. Lastly, number 10. Does it lift up Christ, presenting him as a real person and our only answer? There are different types of messages. A testimony is a good way for a preacher to start because it's natural to begin. It's coherent because it's simply a chronology you know it, right? There's a danger, however, and that's eye trouble, that we end up focusing on ourselves instead of on Christ. So in a testimony, we notice Paul's testimony. Every time he told his testimony, the testimony actually got shorter and the light shone brighter. There's more of Christ in his testimony. So in a testimony, make sure that we leave people with Christ and not with ourselves expository preaching. This is where we move through a passage. The danger is that we end up in remedial reading. This is what it says and this is what it means. This is what it says and this is what it means. It becomes textualism and again we miss out what does this tell me about Christ? How does it bring me to him? Because the truth is in Jesus. A topical study now, a topical study has benefits. It shows me the unity of Scripture. I take a topic and it leads me through. The problem there is I can overwhelm the audience with too much information. And again, all of this information keeps me away from actually meditating on the person of Christ. Every topic should ultimately lead me to Christ. So whatever style of preaching I'm using, the heart of it needs to be to preach Christ and him crucified. We do not preach ourselves, Paul said to the Corinthians. We preach Christ Jesus the Lord and ourselves, your bondservants, for Jesus' sake. Or as Paul wrote to the Colossians chapter 1, verse 28, Him we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. You see there, the tactic and the objective, the process and the conclusion. We're preaching Christ, and what's the, the objective? That everyone is perfect in Christ. We're giving you the raw material, and the objective is that if you eat Christ, if you feed on Christ, 
you are what you eat. And if you think Christ, you live Christ. And if you do, then you become like Christ. So that's our grand objective. Not information, but transformation. Beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, we are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Lord the Spirit.